So we're starting this year, 2015, with a word and an encouragement to you about what God's plan is for our life this year. Now we've known this, what we're supposed to be speaking today, for about a year. And a year ago we had, had received encouragement and prayer to, to, to see what was going to happen last year. But along with that, we also got some direction with what was going to happen at the beginning of this year and what God's plan for our life was for this this coming year, 2015, which we're in right now. So it's no surprise, but we want to release it to you today. Uh, we're talking about build. As you can see on the walls, we have the word build. And this year, 2015, is obviously the year for each of us to build our lives. When uh, My first project that I ever built when I was young and married, early in our marriage, was, was I built my wife a, a walk-in closet. And it was the first time I'd ever done a project, and it was our first house. We lived in a condo uh, in, in, in a, s- a specific town, and when we were living there, these, these army bunkers were trans- tr- translated or built into condos. So we moved into one, and, and I, I, I decided we'd employ or get a, a, a guy who was a builder, and he was retired, and we asked him to come and help me build my first project. So he came in, brought the materials and all the things, and he started started to work on building and he showed me what to do and then he'd leave and he'd leave me a list of things that I'd need to do while he was away. I'd have to either do some sanding and or mudding or taping or, or maybe some painting and then so he'd come back after I'd done my part and he'd show me what to do again. And so by the time I was finished this whole project I was so proud of my walk-in closet and uh, I remember seeing this big glass mirror doors it was sliding doors and then on the end there was a, a, a door that you'd open up and there were shelves and and I had my walk-in closet she had all her clothes in it she thought it was her closet but it was actually mine I built it I was so proud of it and I remember also that this when we went to sell that first house that we ever lived in that that house it was it was a, a the, the condo there were many of these other condos being sold around the similar time and it wasn't easy to sell these things and eventually a couple came in and looked at our house and when they got up into the bedroom they saw this massive built-in closet right along the whole wall and the wife was excited she loved it and said that's exactly what I wanted so not only was it a a great job and I was very proud of myself but it also helped us sell our first house and so from that it took me into a new level of living just by starting in one building project it led us into being able to renovate and build many other houses and I got the bug and now we've got to the place where we've been able to build our own house and that had set me into a a upward spiral of lifestyle of renovation innovating and building that's just one area of my life and because I took on that one project of building God was able to do something so 2015 is a year to build it may not be the for each of us to build a walk-in closet but obviously it's for us to build areas of our lives and God wants us to come and, and 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 work with us and help us and he'll show us what to do and the reason he wants to do that is he wants us to bring us to a new level of living in every single area of lives so that's what we're going to be talking about this year. So 2015, the time to build. A time to build your life, a time to build your family, a time to build your finances, your faith, a time to build your legacy, a time to build your church. And so God is speaking about building. And as we're to start and kick off this year, the greatest thing about building is knowing that you have the right foundation. And so we're going to share a text this morning out of Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 27. It says, so everyone who hears these words of mine, this is Jesus speaking, and acts upon them, obeying them, will be like a sensible, prudent, practical, wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had been built on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a stupid or a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great and complete was the fall of it. And so we want to look at this text as we start in the first point that we are called 
to build. So each of us has seasons that we enter into, and this is the season that God is speaking about now is it's time to build. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 and verse 3, it talks about a time to build. Verse 1, it says, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. Verse 3 goes on to say, There is a time to build. And when we look at this time to build, I believe God is saying this year is a season and a time for us to build many areas of our lives. And God has a purpose in all of this. When we, William MacDonald talked about seasons and times, he said, History is filled with cyclical or cyclical patterns, and these reoccur with unchangeable regularity. Basically, he was speaking about many seasons in life. We can look at summer, autumn, winter, fall, all these things, and then spring again into a new area area of growth. And when we look at every area of life, every area of existence, there are seasons and cycles of of growth and and change. And so God's bringing us into this area where we are starting to develop. And so when we look at seasons, there is a great grace available to each one of us in the midst of a season that God has. A season of God's purpose releases grace to do that purpose. For example, if you were getting seeds, you wouldn't take them in the middle of winter and put them out in the middle of Alberta fields. They're not going to grow. But if you take them at the right time of year, the soil is moist and it's warm weather and you put them in, a miracle of germination happens. And at the same time, we look at Proverbs chapter 10 verse 5, And it goes on to say, He who gathers in summer is a wise son. He who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. And so what we get from this is to understand when there's a season going on from God, wisdom says take advantage of the grace and what God's doing in the midst of that season. Don't try and do something else in another season when it's not God's ability on that, but look at the time. And God's saying this year is a time to build many areas of our lives. So the unwise would say no. But the word, in, I looked in dictionary.com and the, looked up the, the meaning of the word building from that specific area. And the definition says to construct by assembling and joining parts or materials to establish, increase, or strengthen. And my wife and I are going to be speaking for the whole year and specifically right now about tools and and materials that God wants to use in your life to build your life, to strengthen and increase you throughout this year. Why? Well, He has a purpose. Why would He want to build strength in us? Why would He want to prepare us for something? Well, God wants to do great things in our lives, but we must have the ability, the integrity, and the strength to be able to take on what He's bringing into our lives. So when we start to look at someone working out or building their muscles, they start to take on more load. And God's trying to do that, not in a negative way, but God gives us a greater capacity. Anytime in the Bible that God speaks about building to His people, Israel, or in the New Testament, the believers, the Christians, He's always trying to do something. He has a purpose. And the purpose is to lead His people into better lives of blessing. Anytime He says to build, there is a reason. It's to increase you. And there's a wonderful promise given to the people of God in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 2 and 3. And it's talking to a barren woman. But the imagery here is talking to people in their lives when things haven't gone the way they thought they should go or situations have seen dry or things haven't worked out. And he says these things, and I believe he's saying this to us as well. Enlarge the place of your tent. In those days they lived in tents. Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare. Lengthen the cords and strengthen the stakes. For you shall expand to the right and to the left. And your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. Imagine saying to a barren woman that you're going to have descendants that are going to inhabit cities. She might have felt depressed and discouraged, but to hear an encouraging word, come on, get up and build because I have a purpose for your life. God's saying that to us now. The call to build ensures future prosperity, blessing and increase to those who are ready to respond. William MacDonald went on to say this about building. He said, It is to rehabilitate or restore the area of blight 
The word blight is something, it's a disease that comes onto a plant leaf. And the plant leaf withers and defoliates. The leaves fall off and all of a sudden you see barrenness. And so when there are areas of barrenness, what do we do? What do we do in times when things don't seem like they're working out? Things aren't going the way they're meant to go. In the late 1970s and the early 1980s, Chrysler Motor Company went through some terrible times. Financially and strategically, they were going down the drain. And they had a man named Lee Iacocca who came from Ford Motor Company and moved in to Chrysler. And he started to reorganise. He kicked out some people and brought in some friends from Ford Motor Company and reorganised and built that company into, in a new way. In the process, he poured millions and millions of dollars into research and development development for new projects. They thought at the time that he was crazy, but he was building for future. And out of that investment came one of the most amazing products. It was the Chrysler Caravan. And it eclipsed many of the other projects that the Chrysler company had done. And it also was a part of helping that, build, that company stabilize and prosper and move forward into the future. Who's ever driven a Chrysler Caravan? Okay, great. And so the family family vehicles that, that took over. See, Lee Iacocca knew something, that that Chrysler company was not finished. All he had to do was start to build for the future. And God is wanting to encourage you today that He is not finished with you. There are times in our lives when we feel like we have plateaued, or there are times in our lives where we think it's all finished and done with. So what do you do in the midst of despair? You get up, shake yourself off, dust your shoulders off, and build again. Build your life, build your resources, build different areas. Why? You're setting up for a better future. And so God is not finished with you. In fact, He is saying to each one of us right now, let us build again in preparation for the new things He has in store for our future. But there is a dangerous thing that can happen to people that have been in struggles or peril or even defoliation or it seems like there's barrenness around our lives. There's a danger that comes around us where we want to retract from life. You've ever had a struggle in a relationship. You've ever had a, a downturn in business or you've ever lost a job. You want to crawl into your hole and just give up on life. But what God is saying to each of us is don't give up. Get up. I'm on your side. I want to help you out. I want to give you a new beginning. I want to give you a fresh new start in this season to build. So we desire to give up, but God says, let's go up. We, we, we miss out on the bright new future if we retract into our grovel or our hole or our self-pity. What do we do in the systems or times of barrenness? We get up and we build again. When I was growing up, I used to fall off my bicycle when I was learning to ride. And I'd scrape my knees and scrape my elbows. And many of you have probably had the same experiences. And I remember my mum, she used to say to me, Steve, get on that bike again. Don't let it beat you. And now today, because I listen to my mum, the words of a mother to encourage, I can ride a bike. Thank God. <laughs> Who else here can ride a bike as well? It's because you got up and you tried again. You built for the future. And there's nothing like getting on a bike, riding down the hill, the wind in your, in your hair, and you're enjoying the ride of your lifetime. So what to build? God's going to be speaking to us this year about many different areas. Firstly, we want to build our passion and our spirituality for God. Not spookiness, but a real, living, tangible, solid spirituality that is real. And so we've been talking about this over the last few months, being on fire for God. It's a, it's a, re, a real thing that we can tangibly relate to God. It's not some weird existential thing that's way out there. No, it's a life that is passionate and on fire for the real living God. Secondly, we can look at the family being built. You might be single here today and you haven't met the love of your life yet. Well, don't get in your hole and wait. Get out there and hit the road running. Maybe practically you may need to go running, but hit the road running. Get ready for that man or that woman. And when you meet them, they will meet the person who's ready and prepared and built. Hey, guys, get built. Hey, 
Hey girls, get built. Get ready, get prepared for the one you're going to marry. Your finances. We've got to build and prepare our finances for future opportunities that are coming our way. Cash reserves, a whole bunch of different things. I know it doesn't sound all that spiritual, but I tell you, God wants us to be prepared for opportunities to go forward this year. The church, to build the body of Christ in preparation. It's not God's will that anyone in this community would perish. And actually, it's not God's will that anyone in this community would see church as irrelevant. We want to see this church and other churches in this area keep growing and become more relevant. And people walk in and say, whoa, there is a reason for that place being here. And finally, we want to see our legacy, our destiny and our future be built for to go ahead. In conclusion, every area that you choose to build, God is helping you set you up for future blessings. God's grace is ready to help you build this year. It is the time. It is the season to build. So let us build. Turn to the person beside you this morning and say, it is the time, it is the time to build. To build. Second point this morning is we need to build with the right foundation. And so we look back at our text that I shared this morning in Matthew chapter 7. We'll see that there were two builders and they both had heard the same word from God. It is the season to build. They had both responded to that same word that had went out that it is the season to build. And so there were some similarities in these two builders. We can see with these two builders that they were both building houses. We can also see that they must have been in the same kind of area because when disaster and natural things happen, they both, both houses were affected by the same things. And we also see something else in common about these builders is they both had heard the exact same words from Jesus. They had both been under the same teaching and they had both heard the same words. You know, there were so many similarities between these builders, and we can think about these similarities in the same way as, as we've been sharing over the past few weeks about Christians that are on fire for God, they're putting God first, they have a passion for God, or those who might just say they're a Christian by name only. If you look at these two different kinds of people, there's a lot of similarities in them as well. Both of them generally go to church and they hear the same sermons. They bow their heads in the same prayers. And they often have the same kind of speech or the same kind of talk. And if we read in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 and 23, just a few verses ahead, the Bible even tells us that they both call Jesus Lord with their words. And so there's many similarities between people. And we can see the similarities between these two men who were both building in this parable that Jesus tries to teach us so that we can learn and we can grow and we know how to build. But there was also some differences in these two men. And the difference is not maybe quite as noticeable as for most, as most things that we notice. If you think about a house, when we were first married, we used to drive by many houses and we would look at different houses and look at kind of houses that we wanted to build or wanted to buy or wanted to live in. And when you drive by houses, you'll look at the size of them. You'll look at the color. You'll look at the shape, the way that they're designed, the where the windows are. You look at all different kinds of things on those houses as you look at them. But most of us do not drive by some stranger's house, have a look at it, and then march into the front door and say, let me in this house. I need to see the foundation of this place. No, because they're probably going to boot you out straight away because it's none of your business. You're not supposed to be in their house. But we look on the outward appearance of a house. And yet we can see with these two builders that Jesus is talking about, the main difference between these two builders is where they built their house, the foundation that they built their house on. It says here that the wise man built his house on a solid rock, on a strong foundation, on the teaching of Jesus, on the words of Christ. It said the other man was a foolish man, and he built his house on the sand. And so here we can see two people both responding to the same word. It's time to build. Both responding to that same word and yet choosing two different paths on how they would actually build their houses and ultimately build their lives. One man heard what Jesus said, and it said not only did he just hear what Jesus said, he put it into immediate practice into his life. The other builder, it said that he also heard what Jesus said, but he dismissed it and did his own thing. And so we can see how these two builders both had free will. Turn to the person beside you and say, thank God for free will. 
God doesn't create robots. Have you ever noticed that? God doesn't try to put a spell on someone and then all of a sudden you become this robot or this zombie who just does exactly what he says. No, God gave you free will. And these two builders both had free will. They both had the ability to choose and they both made their choice. Both men chose how they would build. And, you know, God is speaking a word to us this year, and he's saying, 2015, it is the year to build. It's the year to build your life and your family and your finances and your church and your legacy. It is the year to build. But you have the free will to make the choice on how you will build your life. Have you ever paused to think about this particular parable? If you've read it, you look at the two builders. Have you ever wondered why a builder would choose to not heed the words of Jesus, to not take the wise advice? Why a builder would choose then to actually build an incredible house but on a faulty foundation? And I was thinking about this, and I've come up with a few reasons of maybe why, but I believe there's a whole, a a lot of reasons that we could probably come up with. But this morning, I'm just going to share a few reasons of why someone would ignore the words of Jesus and build on a faulty foundation. Number one, some people really only care about appearances. So really, they just want people to think they're a Christian. They want to look like a Christian. They want people to comment about their life and say, well, that's a Christian woman. That's a Christian man. And they're not really concerned about becoming a follower of Christ or listening to the words of Christ. Number two, some people are in a big hurry to build. They're in such a big hurry to build that they don't build properly. Have you ever been in a situation where you've tried to do something really quickly and it's fallen apart? That you should have taken your time, you should have had some more patience, you know, it should have taken a bit of time to build something properly, but you rushed at something like a, you know, a bull charging at a, at a red flag and all of a sudden it began to crumble. Some people are in such a big hurry that they forget to build on a solid foundation. You know, maybe they're in a situation where they just say, God, I need a quick fix. You know, they have a particular problem or a particular crisis, and really their prayer is, God, dig me out of this mess. Get me out of this situation. Get me out of this crisis. And in trying to get out so quickly, they're not interested in learning the principles so that they never end up in that same crisis again. Number three, some people think a solid foundation takes too much effort. It'll take too much time and too much effort. And, you know, preparing and building on a solid foundation, it's not the most attractive part of the job. If you think about watching a house be built, it's very rare that people come along and say, wow, that is an amazing foundation. You know, the color, the shape, the style, that is an incredible foundation. No, people make the comments about the house once it's built. And so some people think, you know, a strong foundation, a solid foundation, it just simply takes too much effort. It takes too much time. You know, allowing God's word to build a good foundation also involves pulling up some weeds, pulling up some rocks, maybe digging out some trees out of the way. If there's a particular place you want to build, you say, that is a solid foundation, that the ground is good there. You have to go out there and you have to get rid of some stuff, pull out some old mindsets, pull out some old ways of doing things, so then you can now have that solid foundation to build on. And when I was a child, my dad was a farmer, and so he would go to the field, and we would have to prepare that field before he would sow the seed. And so part of preparing that field was we had to go out there, and we had to pick rocks and pick roots out of the ground. And it wasn't the most glorious job. You got dirty, you got sweaty, and it seemed like it was never going to end. There was always one more rock to pick. And you always wondered the next year, where did the rocks come from again? And how come there was more rocks there again the next year? But as you pick them, and you got rid of them, it prepared the ground for the seed to go in. Do you know if we want to build a solid foundation, there's some rocks, some weeds, some, you know, thorns that we have to dig out so that we have a place to build a strong foundation. Some people don't want to do that because it's too hard to work. It takes too much time for building on a good, solid Christian foundation. It has a price to pay. And some people are simply unwilling to pay it. But Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 38 and 39, if you don't go all the way with me through the thick and thin, you don't deserve me. If your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. But if you forget about yourself and look to me, you will find both yourself 
and me. And so as we look to build a solid foundation with God being first and his words being first, we will build something that will last forever. The last one, what's another reason why sometimes people would ignore the words of God and begin to build on a faulty foundation? Some people don't like what a good foundation is really made out of. They want a good foundation to be made out of philosophy. They want a good foundation to be made out of, you know, just natural abilities. But the foundation to build on is Christ. And there is only one foundation to build a life on, and that is Jesus Christ. And that's not being narrow-minded. That's not having a small, small viewpoint at life. That is the truth. This is what we build our life on, is on Jesus Christ. And Jesus wants to not only be the Savior of your life. He wants to be the Lord. And being Lord of your life means he is the leader of your life. And if he is the leader, what does that make you? What does that make me? The follower. If there is a leader, then there must be a follower. And so Jesus says, I want to lead your life. I want to come into your life and direct you. And that means whenever there is a major decision, or even, can I say, a minor decision to make in your life, that you now have a relationship with God where you say, God, you are my leader. I want your opinion on this. I want to know what you want me to do. I want you to lead me. I want you to guide me. That is the solid foundation. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we have already laid, Jesus Christ. And Paul also said in Ephesians 2, verse 20, Together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. And so if we want to enter into this year with God's word, it is the year to build. It's the year to build your family. It's the year to build your life. It's the year to build your finances. It's the year to build your church. It's the year to build your legacy. As we enter into this, we have to understand that God is looking at our life saying, I want to build your life. Let me come and help you be the leader to build your life. We must have a good foundation. Because if there's two builders who heard the same word, and they both began to build. They both put their effort in. They both put some sweat in. They both put some tenacity in because they both built houses. How sad to have one that crumbled and amounted to nothing. God looks at your life and says, when you build, I want it on a solid foundation of Jesus. I want it on the solid foundation of my word so that you will build and what you build will last forever. So we must have the right foundation. How do we get this right foundation? Number one, by serving God, allowing Jesus to be first. And how do we allow him to be first? I believe the most important principle is to put down our own pride and surrender to his plan. You know, we can get so filled with our own thinking, our own way of wanting to do things, and our own pride that we miss out on his great plan, on his great instructions, on his great manual that's going to enable us to build something that's going to last, something that can be built upon and built upon and built upon for years to come. We cannot have a solid foundation without having Jesus as the leader of our life. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7 says, Yes, you who trust in him recognize the honor God has given him. But for those who reject him, it is said, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. As you read the word of God, there were so many who rejected Jesus and rejected his teaching. But there were so many who received Jesus and received his teaching. And you've seen God take ordinary men and make extraordinary men. Ordinary women make extraordinary women as he built their life. And their life was built on a solid foundation. The second one, how do we build our life on the solid foundation? Let the word of God be your source and be your guide. That means you hear it and you put it into practice. If you look at the two builders, they both heard the same word. Turn to the person beside you this morning and say, we're both hearing the same word. They both heard the same word. And it said one heard and applied. And one heard and dismissed. Which builder will you be? You must hear the word of God and let it be your source and let it be your guide and begin to apply and practice it. Luke chapter 6, verse 46 to 49 says, 
Jesus was speaking and he said, why are you so polite with me always saying, yes, sir, that's right, sir, but you never do a thing I tell you. These words I speak to you are not mere additions to your life, owner improvements to your standard of living. They are a foundation, foundation words, words to build a life on. And if you work these words into your life, you are like a smart carpenter who dug deep and laid the foundation of his house on the bedrock. When the rivers burst its banks and crashed against the house, nothing, nothing could shake it, for it was built to last. But if you just use my words in your Bible studies and you don't work them into your life, you are like a dumb carpenter who built his house but skimped and skipped on the foundation. Who the swollen river came, it crashed in and it collapsed it like a house of cards. It was a total loss. You know, I love this particular verse when it says here, it says, but if you have a solid foundation, nothing can shake it. Nothing can shake it. And it said, if there is no solid foundation, it's like a house of cards and one breath. Have you ever just had a, somebody's been building a house of cards, you just walk by and breathe or kind of just motion some air, and that thing just falls to pieces. Why? Because there is no solid foundation. If you think about every area of your life, you think about marriage for just a moment. If you build on the solid foundation, nothing will shake that marriage. That doesn't mean that things won't try to shake that marriage. It doesn't mean there won't be circumstances. It doesn't mean there won't be some problems that you'll come up against. But nothing can destroy that marriage because it is built on a solid foundation. But if that marriage is not built on Christ, if that marriage is not built on a solid foundation, it is like a house of cards, the first breath, the first problem, the first crisis, and it collapses like a house of cards. It's the same with every area of our life. Jesus says, let me be the foundation under your family. Let me be the foundation underneath your finances. Let me be the foundation out of your decision making, out of your legacy, under your church. Let me be the solid foundation and it will stand no matter what comes up against it. It will stand and nothing will shake it. Close your eyes this morning. I want to pray with you. And I want to pray with you and there's a couple things I was thinking of as I was preparing to pray with you today. If you're watching with us online, we're going to pray in just a few moments. And I want to encourage you to allow the word to go through your heart and begin to assess where your heart is so that you can then pray with us and step in to what God is doing. Even as God is declaring over us, 2015 is a year to build, that you will step into the year to build and you will step in to build on a solid foundation. So I want to ask today with everyone's eyes closed and their heads bowed for a moment, if you're in a place today where maybe you've never given your life to God, you're in a posi position where you say, he's never been my foundation. He's never been the leader in my life. And it's a new year, and I need to start this year with Jesus as the leader of my life. Or maybe you're in a place and you've known about God or even known God to a degree for a long time. But you begin to look at your life, and you're beginning to assess this morning that there are some areas of your life that do not have a solid foundation. There's some areas of your life that one breath and it begins to crumble. One breath and crisis breaks out and you're not standing in that area because there is not a solid foundation where you've really said, Jesus, I need you as the leader of my life. I need your input. I need your wisdom. I need your teaching. I need your words to be the solid foundation of my life. Maybe you've simply noticed your house teeters when things happen. You see it begin to sway and sway, and you're wondering, is it going to fall down to pieces around me? Because you're unsure about that foundation being solid. You know, God is speaking to us saying, it is the year to build. It is the year to build. But we must start on a solid foundation. If either of those of you this morning that you have either never given your life to God or this morning you just recognize there's some sand under what I've been trying to build. I've been trying to do it in my own strength. I've been trying to build this and trying to build that. And it seems like every time I try to build it, it comes crashing down. That is the sign of it's not built on a solid foundation. Choose Jesus as your solid foundation. Choose to allow him to be the leader in your life. Choose to allow pride and your own decision making and the way that you want to do things to be put aside to say, Jesus, I'm going to let your word be the solid foundation under my life. 
if that's you this morning, either one of you, you lift up your hand this morning. I want to pray with you. Okay, fantastic. Just keep your hand in the air, and I want you to pray this prayer with me and say, Jesus, I choose you as the leader of my life. And I thank you that you are speaking to me today, and you are saying, it is the time and the season to build. I thank you that your grace is on my life to build. Now, Jesus, I choose you, and I choose your word as my foundation to build on. I choose to let go of my own ways, my old thinking, and I choose your word to be a lamp to my feet. And I thank you that what I build on you will last forever. In Jesus' name. So I have your tithe and offering message this morning. And I'm going to read out of Malachi chapter 3, which is a famous portion of scripture that most of us know. But I'm going to read from verse 8 to verse 14 this morning. It says, begin by being honest. Do honest people rob God? But you have robbed me day after day. And you ask, how have we robbed you? The tithe and the offering, that is how. And now you are under a curse, the whole lot of you, because you have been robbing me. Bring your full tithe into the temple treasury so there will be ample provisions in the temple. And test me in this and see if I don't open up heaven itself to you and pour out blessings beyond your wildest dreams. For my part, I will defend you. I will protect your wheat fields and vegetable gardens against plunder, the message of the God of the angel armies. You will be voted happiest nation and you will experience what it's like to be in a country of grace. Verse 13, God says, you have spoken hard or rude words to me. And you ask, when did we ever do that? When you said it doesn't pay to serve God, what do we ever get out of it? And so this is a famous portion of scripture that we know. And the Bible's telling us here in Malachi chapter 3, it says that we rob God if we don't tithe. It also says we rob God if we don't give our offerings. So we understand that as believers and as Christians, and we understand that. But what I found interesting was it went on to verse 13 and 14, and it began talking about the mouth of a believer. And it says that God spoke to them and said, you know, you have spoken hard and rude words towards me. And they responded with, God, when have we ever spoken hard or rude words towards you? And he said, when you have said it doesn't pay to serve God, or what do we ever get out of it? And in the New Living Translation, it says, you know, what's the use of serving God? What have we gained by obeying you? And I know none of you in this place would ever be like this, but there are some Christians around the world who make statements like this. What's the point of serving God? God never does anything for me personally. Tithing and giving my offerings, it's never helped me at all. I've had no reward from serving God. And there are actually people who call themselves a believer, but they speak this particular way. And so God is saying that this is a harsh and a rude way to speak. And as I was studying this, I, I was began thinking about why do people speak that way and why does that come out of their mouth? And I began to then think about what the Word of God said in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. And it says, So let us not become tired of doing good, for if we do not give up. Turn to the person beside you and say, do not give up. It says, for if we do not give up, the time will come when we will reap the harvest. And I was thinking about how sometimes people, they may be faithful in their tithe. They may not be a robber. They might be faithfully giving their offerings. But then their mouth begins to speak contrary to what even their giving is doing. And their mouth begins to say, what's the point of serving God? What has God ever done for me? My giving's ne never made a difference in my life. And they begin to speak contrary to the word with their mouth. And what happens is they give up. And then they miss out on that great harvest that God has for them because their mouth has not been aligned with the word of God. 
And so as we're starting a new year and we're starting fresh this year, I think the greatest thing we could do to start a year is obviously, yes, obey the word of God. Yes, be a tither. Yes, give your offerings. Obey the scriptures 100%. But even greater than that is to start our new year with the voice of thanksgiving, to start our new year with the voice of saying, God, you have been so good to me. God, you have been so awesome to me. Serving you is the best decision I have ever made. God, there is great benefit in serving you. There is great benefit in obeying your word. There is great benefit in giving God. And start with the voice of thanksgiving. And God was speaking here to his people and saying, I'm listening to your voice. What is your voice saying about serving God? What is your voice saying about your giving? What is your voice saying about your obedience to the word? Let your voice say there is great benefit in serving God. Just turn to the person beside you and say, there is great benefit in serving God. And so this morning, we want to pray over your giving this morning. We want to pray over your tithe, over your offering. If your preferred method of giving is debit or credit, you can do so in the lobby when we're done praying. But as we start today, let's start with a voice of thanksgiving as we pray today. So place your hand on your envelope and let's agree together. Father, we start, we say, God, thank you. Thank you for your great provision on our life this last year. Thank you for your great provision on our life even in the last few weeks, the last few months. We thank you, God, that you are so good. Without you, God, we would have nothing. And God, this morning we are thankful. We thank you. And we know that there is great benefit in serving you, oh God. There's great benefit in obeying your word. There's great benefit in giving. And so God, this morning as we return the tithe and as we sow our offerings, as we give to the poor, or we give our first fruits this morning, we thank you that there will be a harvest that will come to us, oh God. And we stand upon Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, and we declare we will not get tired of doing good. We will not give up. And we thank you that we will reap the harvest. Just say that with me this morning. We will reap the harvest. And we thank you for it. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you for your goodness on our life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Give us hey, thanks for watching today. If you'd like to partner with us, or if you'd like more information about Global Connections Church, such as service times, or to check out what we're doing in our community and internationally, please visit us at www.greatchurch.ca.